Uh, today, we have an experiment made necessary by time zones. Professor Jha lives in Australia. He's a senior person. He wanted to do his recording at 11 a.m. Australia time. That is not compatible with anybody in India at all. So we couldn't have any discussions. But I have recorded his uh, presentation and distributed it to the discussants. And so we have a split session without the presenter here. But uh, the discussants will show Professor Jha's slides if they wish to refer to any specific one. So it's a very important innovation to be able to include people from all over the world in a simple discussion. Let's see how it goes. OK, so we have three discussions. Uh, first one is Nilesh. Nilesh, please introduce yourself and start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nilesh Deshmukh. And presently, I am based in Bangalore, India. And presently, I'm pursuing my MBA in product management. So my background is I work in manufacturing industry for around one and a half year, chemical industry. And later, presently, I'm experimenting my life with the tech world because, you know, Bangalore is a like a startup world. It is like a tech, tech uh, leader in the whole India. So I'm now entering into the product management in the technology world. And this is something interesting. And thank you, Subodh Mathu, sir, for giving us opportunity to uh, talk about the Indian economy and what are the sectors that we'll discuss in the further panel discussion type. So this is brief about me. Thank you. So sir. please go ahead with your comments. Okay. The topic that uh, Professor Jaha have explained is about what are the uh, principal sectors uh, and what is the transformation happen in that Indian economy. And they have very uh, detailed from past uh, the last few years and of the future, what exactly happened in the Indian economy is, sir, has explained. And it is really an uh, interesting point of view. I got to know about the which sector is doing best at what time. And now for holistic development as a nation, where you have to focus and what are the key areas we need to work as a nation, as an Indian economy. There are primary three sectors, as you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, and primary comes agricultural, secondary is in industry, manufacturing, tertiary is about service sector. Uh, later, I will share uh, the screen uh, what are the uh, of, of the presentation where what are the five sectors and how the growth happened in last uh, 60, 70 years so that we'll get understand the context of what we are discussing in the throughout the uh, session. I will say, as I have experience in technology, some uh, I have experience in technology, as I have said, in manufacturing. What I one thing realize is manufacturing, running, becoming leader in manufacturing is one of the necessary for the becoming superpower in India for the next few decades because we have to compete with the big, big giant like China, uh, who is already master, who is a like super skilled, super efficient in the manufacturing industry that we are lagging and we are on the path. Uh, what that experience showed me that is uh, in, till India, uh, we have the license Raj, a typical word I want to use till 1991. Later, uh, that is removed by the globalization or uh, the, the, by the Narsim Rao Prime Minister. And that day we have taken the journey in uh, booming in the manufacturing sector. I will talk mainly on manufacturing and business context so that whatever I have uh, understanding I can share with you. And later, uh, they realize uh, the ecosystem that we have lagged. For example, China started uh, his his journey from 1960 or 70 after the revolution happened in China, which and they are very clear about what they want to do. There is a like not democracy. This is like they one type of dictatorship. They and by, by that they have improved a lot. But in India, we have the democracy. We have to follow all the things with the rules and uh, democratic way. So it's taking time and efforts to build that ecosystem. And from last, I will say 10 years, uh, to the 2014, uh, we are at the 10th economy in the world. And in the few, like in a one decade, we jumped to the five, fifth. So it is a, not a small change, I will say, in the economic sector uh, that, that India had showed to the world. And in the next 2028, 20, we are trying to be the top third, top, top three economy in the world. And we are visioning that. And in that, the manufacturing sector, 
and the in agriculture sector primary secondary need to be improved a lot have to be more efficient and we are building a that ecosystem if the ports import export that type of ecosystem we are building now uh, with that point uh, another take technology is one of the key area for example uh, few years uh, a few years ago uh, like data is one of the primary uh, thing that is that will dominate after few years and till 2014 15 we are everyone knows the what is the price of data like 200 rupees we have to pay for the 1 gb 2 gb but that revolution in happened data sector that because of geo that made our rapid transformation in the technology and because of which the whole ecosystem is building that supports the manufacturing in the tech so i i feel there is a great uh, if you if you combine uh, this tech and the business manufacturing industry is the one sector then india will be definitely uh, lead the next will be the next superpower and will lead the whole we again become the sony ke chidi i will say in the sector of highest contribution in the whole uh, export or the whole uh, contribution to the world economy i will say so is that it? Are you going to comment on any particular slides that he has? Yes. So I want please. to share one, uh, one, just a second. Is my screen visible now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But we are not seeing. Okay. Yeah. All right. From here, just briefly, I want to introduce one slide, which really will help. This is a... Krishna 2014 distinguish between the five phases of industrial and manufacturing growth in India, that annual growth rate. So in agriculture, the primary sector, we can see from, from 1951 to 2010, this is data given, from 1.8 to the 2.9. So it is, I will say in agriculture, there is a huge scope. There is a huge gap that I am able to see here. And here, uh, the growth rate, if you in the one of the uh, in the session that sir said that we want to be superpower in the agriculture because we have that much of resources but we lagging in the technology or understanding the managing the resources second is the industry that growth rate is also not that much significant growth 6.3 to 7.8 manufacturing is 5.6 to 7.6 but services we can see significantly it is doubled 4.8 to 9.4 we till date 2010-11 we have focused or, or developed a lot on the services sector, but here is a huge uh, area of in this first agriculture and manufacturing industry sector where, if you make it very well work well, then our GDP and GDP capita will improve a lot. That one of the key insightful slide I want to share with uh, with the, all the viewers in this through presentation. Okay, thank you. Just as a note, uh, uh, my friend TC and I were taught by K L Krishna, who is the author. He used to teach econometrics. How much we learned is a different proposition. <laughs> but he was our professor at the Delhi School of Economics. So certainly a very distinguished and very good teacher. Okay. Well, okay, Nilesh, thank you. Uh, let's thank listen you. to Abhilasha and then, you know, TCA. So let's go ahead, Abhilasha. Okay. So I am Abhilasha and I have done my master's in economics recently from Jawaharlal Nehru University and prior to which I did economics honors from Delhi University. So I would like to start off uh, like with the comments from like Sir, sir Slide started off from independence uh, to uh, from there what the British did in terms of deindustrialization to Indian economy as well as the further growth. So at the time of independence, the Indian economic structure was heavily tilted towards agriculture, both in terms of income and occupational structure. We had like 73% share of our labor force in agriculture sector, which also contributed 53% to the share in GDP. In industry, we had 9.8% share in the labor force and 17.8% share in the GDP. And the services sector stood at 17.2% share in labor force and 29% share in GDP. So over the years, the British rule had consciously deindustrialized the Indian economy and discouraged the modern industries. So like the pre-British era, Sir had also mentioned in his slides, India had contributed to 25% of the world manufacturing output. From 1815 to 1832, our cotton textile exports dropped by 92%. 
and by mid 1850s we were importing 25% of british cotton in our in economy so the policies of british were to the extent of like 72% taxation rate on indian textile and 0% taxation rate on the british exports to india so our handicraft industry couldn't face the challenge of the mass produced british commodities and even till 1950 90% of the capital good needs were imported into india our industry grew at 3.8% after world war 1 but was mainly concentrated in cotton textile jute sugar and modern industries whereas the chemical and civil aviation uh, like the modern industries were absent completely from our economy because the british didn't want us to grow in that area also although the british contributed to better transportation communication facility the overall impact on indian industrial and economic development was negative and economic activity was concentrated in few presidency cities only so uh, for the british goods we were like an uh, a source of raw material from where they took all the raw material out and then exported their uh, manufactured goods into the indian economy so there was lack of multiplier effect in terms of income employment capital technical know how as well as financial expertise which are characteristics of an initially industrializing economy and trade and industry were institutionally mechanized to program britain's growth so indian economy at the time of independence was a subsistence economy where there was rampant illiteracy and lack of exposure to aspirational avenues thus it made it difficult for us to transition into modern growth story and we were agriculture based despite that we lacked in food sufficiency the service sector dominated industry mainly due to our uh, interest in trading as well as the railway and banking services which the british slowly developed and there was absence of large scale industrialization thus there was high disguised unemployment in agriculture and people couldn't move out of agriculture so small scale industries were present but the production level was uncritical for large scale employment in those small scale industries and manufacturing had huge regional disparities with heavy urban concentration in the presidency cities so post independence we have seen major phases so like year wise if we categorize so from 1947 to 1966 we have the nehruvian era from 1966 to 1980 we have the period of structural retrogression in the indian economy from 1980 to 1990 we saw the revival period and then 1991 we saw economic crisis and post 1991 we had the economic reforms so after independence our industrial growth was at more than 5% this was on back of the capital goods industry growth as the government expenditure was high in this sector and we followed the mehal nobis model in our second five year plan as well where we had planned development in heavy basic and key industries that was through the capital intensive technology and maybe mainly in the public sector units public sector was given the position of commanding heights in india and it controlled all the major uh, areas and sectors this was because we had been a colonial country for so long we wanted to prevent the concentration of wealth as well as promote more balanced regional growth because up till then only few regions had been developed we also had to keep the price under control as we were a poor economy and we had to generate employment as well as redirect the profits in order to create welfare so we had the industrial policy resolution act in 1956 which reserved 17 industries exclusively for the public sector we also followed import substituting industrialization for self sufficiency as well as consumer good industries they were left mainly to the private sector we were focusing on the heavy industries so during the early years the belief was that uh the countries which industrialized faster could compete better with the already developed nations and the gdp growth would happen through uh, eventual trickle down but that didn't happen because uh, they didn't trickle down to the lowest section of the society the intermediate goods were developed mainly in ancillary units which were inputs in supply chain to heavy industry so historically developed area of, of gujarat maharashtra they continued leading in consumer goods growth 
and during 1957-58 we had the balance of payment crisis that was owing to the high food imports as well as severe drought in our country and we had raw material imports which were very high in terms of gold copper crude oil in 1961 to 66 we saw a decline in consumer goods availability in our country as the demand outstripped outstripped supply and there was inflation which discouraged growth due to lack of developed infrastructure and restriction on import of raw material there were we also faced droughts in our economy from 1964 66 to 65 66 and which created a uh, shortage of essential commodities we also had political instability as well as wars in 1962 and 65 after which our growth story started dropping so the services sector uh, grew at that time because there was growth in the financial sector because uh, sbi was established in 1955 lic was established in 1956 unit trust of india in 1964 as well as the uh, development of post, post office led saving mobilization in the country the raid, road and railway infrastructure services was among the top 3 expenditure sources we also had like gaps in our planning period from 1966 to 69 when we went on plan holiday in 1977 to 79 when we had rolling plan so what happened in 1966 to 80 when we had restricted growth so mainly it was private sector led economy then private sector was declining in performance mainly one factor can be the poor pricing strategy the public goods should have been given at full subsidy the pure public goods the merit goods could have been given at partial subsidy the public utilities we should have at least recover the cost of production and uh, market pricing should have been followed for the commercial goods and services but we had less than proportionate pricing for almost all public goods and services and there was rampant overstaffing in the public sector there was poor management and training of the people and there was rampant political interference the raw materials had to be sourced from other psus only this created a lack of autonomy in the public sector due to political and bureaucratic control and there were also that license raj so in licensing created rigidity in entry expansion as well as exit from the economy and it was interspersed with nepotism and bribery there was high inefficiency there was lack of competition and it removed all incentive for capital infusion in the economy as well as technological upgradation or cost cutting our import uh, substituting policy and the over protection we gave was not good for us and import duty was as high as 400% in 1976 with quantitative restriction as well as import quotas there was canalization in which allowance of imports was via licensed traders only the result of all this was the promotion of illegal activities in the economy as well as black economy and tax uh revenue was lost through that so india had poor taxation structure with very high rates of taxation it even went to 97.5% for more than 10 lakh income in 1976 and we have multiple tax labs which was complex so government excessively controlled markets as well as administered price mechanism with restrictive rules like fera so industry declined and there was average per capita income growth of 1.3% per annum from 1947 to 1979 also the hindu rate of growth it is dubbed as and in 1980 we had the industrial policy resolution after which revival began so there was reformation of the industrial structure in india in 1986 we had the export promotion scheme in which the import duty on capital capital goods were rebateable and it simplified the grievance redressal mechanism in the economy there was also rise in the agricultural productivity which led to increase in purchasing capacity increasing demand for intermediate goods we had also introduced open general licensing in our economy so that some goods were given single clearance window from the rbi it resulted in easier raw material availability in our economy so professor tendulkar had said that the 1980s gdp growth was on back of high borrowings of 
the government and the expenditure was borrowing base so after that we did go into the crisis in 1991 so service growth was led by banking sector with spread of services to rural areas there was promotion of entrepreneurship through this and internal trading was expanded in agriculture with apmc mandis nafed and trafed and um, there was rise in transportation structure road and railways yet the service sector growth was more than 80% dependent on the urban areas and more than 40% concentration was in four cities of delhi bombay kolkata and chennai so in the crisis of 1991 there was high fiscal deficit in center and state and major expenditure was done on populist activities in the years prior to that so there was poor targeting of subsidies the high government expenditure decreased the liquidity in the economy which increased the interest rate and discouraged private investment and led to crowding out which further decreased the capital formation in the economy there was high inflation which led to poor food stock management poor industrial structure as well as high raw material pricing making the goods income uncompetitive in the global economy we suffered from high current account deficit as well as the forex pressure along with the gulf war which increased the crude oil pricing which increased our import bill further so indian industrial backwardness was there and there was high cost of production with poor technological development and lacking productivity in terms of agriculture at time of independence we also had the land reforms in terms of abolition of zamindari the tenancy reforms the sealing and land consolidation acts the land reforms were introduced in order to increase the equity uh, provide protection to the tenant to encourage investment in land but a lot of gaps were given in terms of personal cultivation coming out to be a big loophole and the rural capitalist class which emerged was from the earlier landlord class itself so the reforms did not actually take place there was lack of land records in the rural areas as well as the contracts were mainly mainly oral so it led to a lot of confusion land sealing was a, uh, exploited in terms of benami transactions in rural areas and there was misuse of the voluntary surrender clause and there was lack of political will as well as administrative support mm -hmm. the cooperating farming idea in which we could pool the small land holdings to use capital equipment could have been successful but people lacked trust and corruption incidences were high so there would be need of modern land reforms where we should focus on environmental sustenance as well as farmer training on sustainable agricultural practices the green revolution was highly hailed but uh, there was lack of crop diversification as well as it created poor ecological impact which we can see now in the ever falling quality of land as well as water tables in punjab haryana area there was increase in inter regional and interpersonal inequality because the rich people rich farmer class was the one which could afford the green revolution as well as the regions were limited in india in which green revolution was introduced there was the development of capitalist farmers and uh, so there the green revolution was not fully successful Uh, so there is need of better soil health now as well as quality seeds in, and irrigation reforms in the economy there is need for credit policy self help groups and marketing reforms as well as storage drying facility as well as state support in agriculture market is needed so that would be my contribution to this thank you so much abilasha it was uh, very detailed and uh, obviously you put a lot of time and effort into it and i'm grateful to you for that uh, it's always good to hear such a detailed discussion <clears throat> and uh, let's uh, shift to my you, compatriot uh, tca who always uh, we'll live through all of these things that you discussed <laughs> exactly <laughs> so exactly is, what i was going to say <laughs> we haven't lived we haven't studied them we lived through them uh so here we are so let's see what the wisdom of the old days let's listen to mr rakavan let's go to see i was about to say that but to actually live through this really the boy and i were both born in 1951 so <laughs> from then till now we've seen it all and uh, as they say the trend saying is there the more things change the more they stay the same 
and uh, what uh, is striking is that we get these periods about 30 years apart 25 30 years apart of bursts of reforms where the growth rate etc falls to such abysmally low levels that the government has no option but to do something about it. Obviously, the uh, the first burst of reforms, as you said, was you know the agriculture reforms, uh, zamindari and land cleaning and whatever else that was there in in 1951-52-50 that that period. Then there was another set of reforms, if you can call it that, in 1956 with the uh, Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956, all that resolution and stuff. But after that, you find that the thing simply became straight jacketed for another 25, 26, 30 years. And the next set of basic structural reforms that we got was in the mid 80s. People tend to think that uh, the reforms of 91 were the big reforms. They were big only in the sense that they abolished a few things. And the most important of those was uh, industrial license. But other than that, if you look at 1991, it, it was nothing great, you know. Um, the process towards uh, the abolition of industrial licensing actually had begun way back, slowly, but it had begun in some time when the government was there between 77 and 80. And uh, Arvind Virmani is a former chief economic advisor and a well-respected economist, has written several papers on this, showing how the reforms actually began way back in 77, 78, around that time. But they were very, very slow. When Rajiv Gandhi came, the, uh, there was a huge in economic reforms by the standards of those days. Uh, but uh, the problem was that it landed us some of those reforms at any rate were not accompanied by fiscal discipline. So we ended up with the 1991 balance of payment crisis. And uh, that led to a very small part of the economy being reformed. As I said, industrial licensing. And the other part was the financial sector. Now, this is very, very important because we could reform the financial sector without it causing any political pain. Because stockbrokers and bankers and insurance agents and all of those guys, they don't matter politically. The good thing about this was that it allowed a lot of capital to be freed up, the rustic capital to be freed up, to go into the stock market and so on. And it allowed foreign capital to come in very slowly. If you actually study the period from, say, 91 to 2000 to 10 years, and I had to write about these things on a practically daily basis. Uh, it was very frustrating. The speed at which those reforms, even the financial sector reforms, were carried out. And there was a very important reason for that. <laughs> that the Reserve Bank of India and the financial industry didn't know what to do. They, they were simply, you know, they were like those birds of Mauritius, the dodos which had forgotten how to fly. So after 35 years of uh, public sector dominance, and forget public sector, finance ministry dominance of the financial sector, the expertise was lacking. So, uh, that's what they were doing throughout that period. Very, very scared. I used to talk to these guys and they were saying, oh, but if you do this, I don't know what will happen. It took 10 years of experience for them to get the confidence, for the government to get the confidence to actually go forth 
some fairly large reforms in the financial sector. And that has continued. Uh, it, it just goes on and, and, and fundamentally it continues uninterrupted because there are no votes there. But in agriculture, the reforms Mr. Modi tried with two, three years ago with the farm laws thing, it came unstuck. Just didn't happen. Manufacturing, after the 30 years ago, 32 years ago, what we had, industrial uh, licensing being abolished, after that, nothing much has happened. Uh, the, the main difficulty is that we always, in India, in the manufacturing sector, we get reforms in the wrong direction. Uh, after after 91, right? in, in 2011 or 12, uh, the UPA government made it impossible for industrialists to acquire land at cheap rates. They said you have to pay the farmer four times the market rate if you want to set up a greenfield thing. One, the rate, four times the market rate. Second, nobody knows what the market rate is. So you can imagine how difficult it is in India to set up a factory unless the land is allotted to you by the government. So that's one, the land problem. The labor problem began with the 1948 uh, industrial dispute stuff uh, when it was further refined in the 50s, mid 50s. Uh, that problem hasn't gone away. I know the unions today are not what they used to be. But even so, one of the reasons is people don't realize and don't, or even they realize they don't talk about it. The one reason why the service sector has expanded so fast is that those rules don't apply. The Industrial Dispute Act rules don't apply in the service sector. Uh, beyond the point, I mean, you know, it's, it's okay. Now, contract employment began in the service sector. So the industrial district act really doesn't apply over there. Right? The, the unions fought against it, but they haven't been able to do very much. So the land market is very hard. Uh, the labor market is very hard if you want to set up manufacturing. And finance, which you could actually now, you can get it much more easily than you were able to in the past. So what will you do with the money you take? I speak to many guys, restless, I used to. And all of them used to say, Ki paisa leke kya karenge? Kahan pe factory lagayenge? Kaise lagayenge? So that's, that's one set of problems. The other set of problems, of course, is state government. Then it's not enough for the central government to do something. The state government has to agree. So you guys, I don't know how old you were in 2011-12, but you remember this West Bengal crisis of uh, both the Tatas and, uh, you know, the Tatas may be wanting to set up that thing and uh, yeah, okay. manufacture there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it just didn't happen. So, I mean, to cut a long story short, we have a lot of non-economic structural problems which, do, which, which spill over onto the economy. So, it, it the only good thing that's happened is that from a base rate of growth, rate of growth of GDP of around three, three and a half percent, we have now come to about six percent. Uh, and that's a very good thing. Uh, it's base almost doubled. And uh, now for the coming 20 years, the problem is given the large size of the consumer market, you know, it, it's equal to the populations of Europe, America, Africa, Latin America. You've got a huge consumer now. How do you produce enough for all of these people? Just imagine the draft on human resources, financial resources, other physical resources, electricity, water, etc. like what China is experiencing. Uh, it's huge. Now, you say, all right, like China, you say, I don't care. And I'm going to do this because I want that to be better off. You now, in, in the 21st century, in the third decade, you immediately run into the environmental problem. You, China, escaped that. 
China was able to do what it did because nobody was conscious of what conscious of what was happening to the environment. But today we have to be. We, we, you know, the Europe has already introduced all sorts of laws. So that imposes another very huge constraint on the rate of growth of manufacturing in the country. Uh, agriculture is doing okay, but you know, it's, 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 it's the numbers are very dodgy and we don't really know what is happening in agriculture. Certainly landlessness is going up and that sort of thing. Uh, services sector is simply a statistically just a residual sector. <laughs> if you, if you can't, because you know, if you don't know what's happening, if you know what's happening in agriculture, you know what's happening in manufacturing. But you don't know whatever you don't know, that is, you put it in the services sector. So from the lady who comes and cleans your house in the morning till the CEO of uh, say Geo or something, we're all in the services sector. And uh, <clears throat> aggregation, me measuring that is very, very difficult. But I don't think any, anybody even tries in India to measure that, except in telecom and banking, you know, with some amount of value addition, etc. that they do. But it's a lot of guesswork. So, thought point is this, that if we can do no more than to grow at 6.5 to 7% over the next 10 years, that's, I think, about the maximum we can go for. Those old days of you know, 30 years of 10% growth and all that. But that's not going to happen because of constraints. So I will stop there. You're muted, Subodh. I know you have to leave. So very quickly, let me say, I agree with most of what you are saying. Okay, it's not very different from my thinking. And the need, uh, structural reforms is such a, you know, what, what should I say, jargon sounding term. What it really means is that the rules of the game. The rules of the mm -hmm. game are not conducive to scoring high. Okay, And to put it in cricket terms, India's run rate is like that of test matches. The run rate that used to be okay in test matches, you could have one maiden over and the people would say, oh, the batsman is just settling in, so it's a maiden over, right? That's our, <laughs> where our run rate, you know, you know what a maiden over is, I hope, <laughs> but maybe the term is obsolete, but you know, you could have three maiden overs, okay, fine, the batsmen are settling in, maybe they'll score after lunch. So we are, <laughs> <laughs> we are in the test match run rate. We need, we need to, to be change in... the game. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Or we need to change the game from test to 20. <laughs> we need to be in ODI, you know, not 20. But <laughs> well, at least we need to have the run rate of ODI. And the run rate is, of course, better than it used to be. Because previously we used to lose test matches. Now we win test matches, right? That's expected. Well, wait, wait, wait. Can I just interrupt, Subodh, to remind you of that incredible match? I think it was at Chennai. It was Bapu Natkarni bowling. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> 31 overs, 27 maidens, 4 runs, no wickets. <laughs> <Yes. That's what laughs> I remember that, you know. So the run rate is actually now of the winning test team, but it's still not that run rate of the winning ODI team. So in very simple terms, we are uh, we need major changes in the rules of the game, but actually some of the rules that have been changed couldn't be changed okay. because of agriculture, as TCA mentioned. And others which are really related to cutting off imports are actually doing no good to us. It, they look like we are setting up, Apple is setting up manufacturing. But, you know, the yield of Apple phones in China is 50 percent. The yield meaning of those that are acceptable that come out. We just don't emphasize that the capacity <laughs> to produce high quality material. We only focus on the capacity to produce. And whatever be the quality, that's fine. But that's not going to be enough. We are, let me put it this way, we are at a dangerously <coughs> seductive growth rate. It's dangerously seductive because it's twice the Hindu growth rate. And by the way, that term was coined by Professor Raj Krishna. 
And when I taught in Jaipur for one year, he was the head of the department at Rajasthan University. So I was <laughs> next to the man who coined the term the Hindu growth rate. And let me tell you a story from the time. Once he was on the UP advisory board, uh, economic advisory board. <clears throat> and I asked him, sir, what happened when you went to Lucknow and came back? He says, you know, Subodh, in Lucknow, the, even the flies don't fly. <laughs> <laughs> the fly was sitting in the same spot as it was when I went last time. <laughs> so what do you expect to happen? Is, well, it was a pretty bad time at those days. But of course, we are now at a dangerously seductive growth rate. We think we are the fastest growth <laughs> economy in the world, but this will not cut it. Okay, It will not cut it. We will not be able to deliver. And this is why the last few slides of Professor Jha talking about structural reforms are important. We all know that the British screwed us. Okay, fine. You know, we know it, right? But they're long gone. And there's <laughs> no point in uh, focusing on that. The point is, how do we get to be a, a strong country by 2047? We have only 24 years left. It's not much. Uh, and at 6.5%, uh, it's not going to make it. It's not going to create the jobs that people need. And it's not going, because the nature of the economy is still such mm -hmm. that it doesn't produce jobs for low-skilled people. And the nature of the education system is such that you keep producing low-skilled mm -hmm. people. So you have lousy schools, which produce low-skilled people, and you have the industry, the economy, which doesn't produce. So they end up in as what my friend TCA said, the services sector. Whatever it is that you are doing, you are in the services sector. <laughs> Whether you are shining shoes or you are cleaning homes or you are providing banking services, you are in the services sector. It's become a meaningless catch-all <laughs> term as to what exactly it is that you are doing. Anyway, I think <clears throat> um, we have had a very, let me stop. And let's see. I just want to make one last point. Yeah, before you go, yeah. Even a couple of minutes, yeah. Yeah. You see, the for historical reasons of British oppression or whatever you want to call it, we have given ourselves a structure, overall structure, which emphasizes equity at the expense of efficiency. And until we reverse that, you know, what we were saying about structural reform, rules in the game, we have to move away for a short while, maybe 30, 40 years, from this incredible emphasis on equity. Our courts, our political parties, our administrative system is constantly looking at equity at the expense of efficiency. And uh, anybody who tries to emphasize efficiency uh, comes a proper, you know, you're yes. either voted out or you're not allowed to do anything. So on that dismal note, thank you okay. to both. I must yeah. go. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Nilesh Abhilasha, thank you for great sharing you. Yeah. See you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye to you. Bye. Bye. Okay, let's continue. Goodbye. So uh, let me now yield the floor to Nilesh or Abhilasha to see whether they have any comments. Yeah, so at the end, at the end, uh, actually, I've learned many things from both the speakers. I have gotten the win new terms, but the one thing I realize uh, is like that last note that important is super seductive. Have a growth that you have mentioned is something I hit my mind. Oh, is it risky for, of Indian because now next few years, decades will be like millennials will lead the this uh, further twenty two to three decades. And now I am one of the millionaires in that. So I got really uh, some stuck point in that, that how we can make it a uh, wide free, or we can say uh, more efficiency rather than just like equity that he said. So it is a really great interaction with uh, you and both of you and great learning for me also. Thank you. Abhilasha. Yes, I also had a great learning experience from Sir and Nilesh as well and your comments. So I was wondering like about even the education sector, like what can we do going ahead? Like if you have any comments. Okay. Let in me terms first, of... let, yeah. Okay. I'll talk about it. Let me first address the equity versus efficiency. Okay. Because it's a very important point. And for me, 
the equity must be in the opportunity. It's equality of opportunity in the long run that matters. Okay, I mean, look, you have a kid born to Narega family. That kid has no opportunity in the future, none, because this is likely to be stunted physically. Mm -hmm. Is not going to go to a decent school, has no role models in the family or nearby. There's no chance of these kids uh, getting anywhere near being productive. You know, they may make it to middle school or something like that, maybe to high school. But the teachers, are, as you say, teachers are lousy. The system stinks. Nothing happens. So you produce an underclass of people who are not going to be productive. And then we put them in the service sector. It's just a holding place. Okay, you got nothing, so you become something, you know, you just go and do some job which makes you eight, 10,000 rupees a month. Okay, there are rich people who want your service, so you get a job servicing the rich people. It's not a very productive job. So we have a system which really doesn't provide the equality of opportunity. And it covers a broad set of things like health, education, uh, and lack of discrimination let's put it let's be blunt if you're going to have <clears throat> uh, people discriminated against on the basis of what i call traditional identities which includes caste religion tribal status language whatever you want to call if you have discrimination against that then you are not going for efficiency mm -hmm. okay so i mean you know you're going to hire somebody from your own caste well, that's not efficient. Okay, and that's not even equitable. That's just stupid. Okay, <laughs> it's not even equity. It's like okay, I only hire fellow Mathurs. Okay, fine. <laughs> that, that's stupid. Like I don't care who you are. I have you in my show, right? And because we need to be effective, if not efficient, but at least effective. So on education, Abhilasha, I think there is actually no hope that the state governments will do a better job. They just have no interest in it whatsoever. And you look at the large number of NGOs who are working to help in the education sector. Pratham doing a great job. The hundreds of small people, you know, if you go to ask any people in college, they say, oh, while we were in college, we went and helped the local school children in the slums learn. Why? Because the schools don't do anything. The only thing that's emerging out of that is that if you read the ACER reports, which Pratham produces, for the first time, the number of children going to private school in India is more than the number of children going to government schools. Poor parents have given up on government schools. So they sacrifice their lives. They don't do anything. They send their kids to uh, school private school. In fact, you know, personal anecdote, I was in a car from Mumbai to Pune. At that time, you know, there was a controversial Hindi movie. So I asked the driver, have you seen this movie? And he said, sir, my wife won't allow me to spend 400 rupees to see the movie. Let's see whatever is on TV. We need the money for our children's tuition. Okay. So she says, what are you going to a movie hall to see movie? Entertain yourself on TV. <laughs> Don't see it. Just focus on the children. Okay, so The parents are totally focused on the children and only the non-profit sector can do it. Okay? There's no way that the state governments are going to reform. Okay, We have been writing for 30 years, 50 years. Uh, the teachers don't go. The teachers don't teach. The nobody cares. And what I've heard recently is that it's not just at the school level. You go to the lower level universities in Bihar, right? They don't complete the three-year program in three years. You cannot get your degree in three years. They don't open on time. They don't hold exams on time. It takes four to five years just to get your BA three-year degree, not because you are a bad student, but because there's no exam. <laughs> There are no classes. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, in Darbhanga district. You can look it up. Lalit Narayan Mishra University. They say, sir, the website is not updated in three years. So this cannot, will not change. You know, we can keep writing about it, that this should change, that should change. It's not going to change. You know, the, I've given up writing recommendations about this. The only way forward is for young people to set up 
nonprofit institutions and do the job. And fortunately, because of the spreading technology, the Guruji is now in Google, right? <laughs> Guruji is sitting in Google and is not longer needed. So at least the bright young poor kids, uh, they can use the smartphones. And there are people working to deliver the content in the local language. But to think that actually uh, that these teachers and they actually you can't blame the teachers. The teachers are selected by the political authority. Political authority is not interested in giving. Now, of course, the exceptions, you know, Tamil Nadu has the midday school lunch program is very good, very effective. So you can find examples of success. But if you ask any other state, why don't you go and learn? And then education is a state subject, school education. Why don't you go and learn from that? They only say, what happens there doesn't apply here. Say, so, have you found your own solution? Answer is, we are doing the best that we can. Okay, fine. So it's not going to happen. For Especially for young people, you should be very clear that I don't see how it can happen. The only thing is to provide online free education or with very limited payment. Set it up. It is not so tough to teach history, geography, mathematics to fifth grade students. It's not so tough. It's very standard book. And there are lots of young people who can explain it, who are making money by providing tuitions. It can all be shifted to online. And fortunately, uh, online is not very yet uh, good in rural areas, but it's coming. It's coming. It's certainly coming. And we can bank on that, that look, we have a way forward. But otherwise, frankly, there has to come a time when you have to say, look, this thing can't be solved. It can't be solved. You know, this is not maybe in a particular state, but it just is not. Anyway, I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but I'm optimistic that there's enough money and enough young people who can step in. Okay. You know, we have uh, like pardon? I I was saying like in terms of the universities, you were saying that they are taking a lot of time to give degrees. Every year there are a lot of fake universities as well which are yeah. coming out. Yeah. So it's just you know, nobody cares, you know, what the heck, you know. And all you know, uh, Narayan Murthy said uh, that eighty percent of India's engineering graduates are unemployable. Because even when they make it to engineering college, after you take out the top maybe 50, 60, 100 engineering colleges of India, IITs, NITs, and so on, the rest of them have just come up to mint money. Those, uh, One of my friends who works in Dharwad, he said, suppose the people get BCom degree and they have never done a single account that is realistic. They don't know. So he said, we are setting up a system that after they finish their BCom, they come and do a realistic account of a company. Because what are they going to do with the BCom degree when you've done, the whole point is to teach accounting, right? You've never done an account because nobody cares. So we have a terrible situation. It's captured in the Human Capital Index of the World Bank. When you look at the school ranking, it's we are at a level of 0 0.48. China is at 0 0.66. And we cannot compete uh, with that level. Okay, So this is a major structural issue that you have pointed out. And we can't just have manufacturing if we don't provide jobs for the young people who never get a good education. I'm working uh, with an NGO called FEA. It has currently every year 60,000 students free. One year they give soft power training, soft training, teach them English, teach them how to think, how to speak. I'm a mentor to those kids. Uh, I work with them. They are all hardworking and motivated. They all come from low income families. They're very motivated. One fellow said to me, sir, I go to work at 6 a.m. I come home at 6 p.m. At 7 p.m. I'm in your class. Right. So you see that Nobody has helped them. Nobody. And they are the elite of the disadvantaged because they are so hardworking and so motivated. 
that after 12 hours of work, they can still sit in the class. And yet, all this support has bypassed them. Nothing. So you say, oh, we in Indian schools, we teach rote learning and not critical thinking. Well, we didn't teach them rote learning either. <laughs> so they are not in any situation. But at the same time, now FEA is into villages. They're expanding heavily into the North Indian villages. Rajasthan, I know because I've helped them expand. I've talked to the village kids in Haryana, UP. And they're basically clueless. Because they have no body to really push them forward. And you know how important teachers are. But there's nobody. And Nilesh is an example of somebody who's come through difficult times. But not everybody can be just that. You have to raise the average. And you certainly see the whole system leaving even these hardworking, motivated kids with very little productive capacity. So I I, digitization is we can we believe or we can take most of the leverage because nowadays uh, like government also planning one every school government school have some system through which they providing like they have various initiatives till date I don't know how they will implement but there is a hope that through technology technology is efficient we are leading in one of the top five or top three countries in the world. So I hope digitization is the only one way because human resources are lagging, the money is lagging. I will say in the whole ecosystem, in the if you are rural part, I will say in Maharashtra also. I can, from experience, I come from like a small village. I can understand what are the challenges they are facing, but digitization. I see the hope in digitization. Yeah, I also see the hope. Uh, you know, that's why I'm saying that FEA is expanding into. Uh, villages and the staff are so dedicated i was talking mm. to the person going uh, and i said what are you going into this small i was helping her and mm. I, I said look you're pretty young she says sir i'm 28 years old i have a child in delhi i said what are you doing in this village she says no sir i have to do it so you know there are people the digitalization will come through the non-profit groups you know the mm. fea will probably have one lakh students a year in two or three years because we can't wait we need to get you know those kids once they are past 10 years their future is doomed you know because they don't get a decent education at the basic level there's nothing that you can do in when they are 16 years old you suddenly start teaching them third grade mathematics they are not even going to sit in your class you read pratham's report acer Fifth grade kids cannot do second standard reading and mathematics. You read it. So I didn't write it. They are there. So this is the situation. And therefore, the only answer is that as incomes increase, some people are sacrificing and putting their kids in school, private school. And others who are not able to afford it or there's no private school, their only answer is digitalization and giving them access through the smartphone because you are never going to convince the state governments that they need to have better schools. A few states maybe, but big states, North Indian states, I don't see, I'm not optimistic. Okay, let's end it here today. Thank you so much, unless you have some last questions or comments. All right, so it was a very nice session. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, you yeah, know, it's you. Uh, always my friend TC and I say it's always good to talk to young people and listen to them. More important for us to talk only to listen to them, give them an opportunity and listen, actually, not just so that, you know, honestly, that is the whole purpose of this channel to give the young people a chance to be uh, more productive, to learn more. For young people like us, we have like uh, both of your uh, experience will be a hundred percent decade of uh, hundred years of experience we got to know from the distilled world that in the economy sector, you few terms will be resonating definitely after this session. Also, these few terms like equity, efficiency, the yeah. growth, these are the key terms will be always well focus on yeah. equality of opportunity. Yes, yes, okay. that is my mantra these days. That look, yeah. it doesn't really matter. 
that much if your father is not getting a great job, but the sons and daughters must. Okay, for them the future must be bright because parents, Indian parents, they focus on their kids first, right? They yes. focus. It's well known. I mean, there's nothing new in it. They focus on their kids first, and they'll sacrifice for their kids. Give the kids a good chance. Don't let yes. them be twenty years old and unable to do anything except service sector, right? Do whatever it is that you do, the government classifies you as service sector. That's not a job. You know? That's not a productive job. Okay. You need okay. Anyway, let's end it here. And thank you so much. I hope to have you back again in some other session. Till then, sure. let's say bye to the viewers. And I'll be back with another session soon. Okay. Bye bye everyone. Thank you. Okay, let's first stop the recording and let's see where's my button to...